the next talk uh, will be by uh, Brandon Boer, and uh, it will be also a video uh, already uh, registered, so you will see the video by Brandon. And then you will have time So it is a, a talk by uh, a contribution by Brandon Borer and Andre Platzer. Uh, we will listen to the talk and then we will have time at the end of the talk for uh, addressing questions. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Brandon Borer. I, I'm going to talk about constructive refinement logic for hybrid games. If you would like to hear more about the underlying logic of constructive hybrid games, please come to our itch card talk tomorrow as well. Why are we refining constructive hybrid games? Let's walk through the title one word at a time. We use a refinement logic in the sense of program refinement logics. These allow us to compare the possible behaviors of two systems. So I could say that alpha is less than or equal to or refines beta if it has at least as many behaviors as beta does. Or if they have the same behaviors, we could say they are equivalent. There are lots of rules for each programming construct. For example, if I have alpha choice beta, that means a program where I can choose either alpha or beta, then that would refine the if statement, which only chooses alpha when p is true. One practical application of these refinement logics is that you can verify large complex programs by first verifying a simple program and then showing refinement between the simple and complex version. We will also discuss some applications of refinement that are more specific to our case. Our logic is constructive, and it builds on the constructive differential game logic, also known as CDGL, that is introduced in tomorrow's paper. Like any game logic, it has two kinds of modality, diamond alpha safe and box alpha safe. Diamond alpha safe means there exists a behavior of alpha that makes the post condition safe true, whereas box alpha safe means this is the case for all behaviors. If you're familiar with Hoare logic, these are very similar to partial and total correctness specifications. However, what do these mean in the setting of constructive games? A constructive proof of diamond means that we can actually witness or exhibit the safe behavior of alpha. Whereas a constructive proof of box alpha safe means that we have given a universal argument that doesn't control alpha, but just shows that all possible behaviors are safe. In this paper, we also give a constructive notion of refinement. As far as we know, it's the first such definition. We say that alpha constructively refines beta if I can compute the strategy for beta from a strategy for alpha with the same post condition. While constructive logics are widely used to verify functional programs, there has been far less work on constructive versions of program logics, that is, logics like Hoare logic and dynamic logic and game logic that reason about stateful imperative systems. We hope that CDGL can spark further interest in constructive logics of imperative programs. We work in the setting of hybrid systems or hybrid games. This means that we have discrete, continuous, and non-deterministic dynamics. The continuous dynamics are usually represented by some kind of differential equation. This opens up a lot of practical applications. For example, any kind of transportation system such as a car or train where there is a discrete computer making decisions over a physical system. There are also many applications in medical and energy fields. But this is also interesting from a technical perspective. One thing we'll show is that you can actually show refinements between continuous programs and discrete programs. This is somewhat surprising. Constructivity and hybridness also interact in interesting ways, but that's more of a focus of the paper and of the talk tomorrow. We also work in a setting of games. In game logics, there is a nice correspondence between the angel player, representing the player that we control, and the diamond modality, which is existential. There is also a nice correspondence between the demon player, who represents our opponent, and this box modality. When we reason about the opponent, we must give a universal argument. Games make a simple change to our modeling language. We add a D that represents switching players while playing alpha. And there's always this two-player back-and-forth dynamic. 
This unique combination of features is not arbitrary. It allows us to study some interesting new questions. A main theorem that we'll study in this talk is the relationship between games and systems. There has long been a folklore theorem that winning strategies for hybrid games correspond to hybrid systems. If I have a strategy, I can plug in all of Angel's choice and leave behind a system that captures all of Demon's choices. We are going to formalize and prove this theorem using our refinement calculus. It was fundamental to have this combination of refinement, constructive, hybrid, and games because this only works for a computable strategy and we need to refine hybrid games to hybrid systems. Not only is this an interesting theorem that we've formalized, but we also hope that this relationship has practical applications as well. Our broader program of studying constructive hybrid games was motivated by applied work in our lab looking at the synthesis or extraction of executable code from proofs about systems. We have realized that constructivity and games both give us more robust synthesis tools and also make it possible to synthesize control code. In this paper, we have shown that reducing games to systems is one possible implementation strategy. This is important because there is much better support for hybrid systems in practical tools as compared to hybrid games. On the flip side, this is a theoretical paper and will be a theoretical talk. I just wanted to show some of the practical questions that motivate this theoretical work. Let's introduce the games modeling language with a simple example, a one-dimensional push-pull cart. Let's say the cart is on some track that starts at XL and ends at XR. The players are standing at either side, with Demon pulling or pushing on the left and Angel pulling or pushing on the right. What properties could we prove about this game? One simple property is that I can force the car to stay in place. Here the game is represented PP. And I show that assuming Demon is initially in control of the game, represented by a box modality, I would then be able to ensure that X is always equal to X0. But how do I write down the rules of the game? I start by writing Demon's turn. Demon has a discrete choice, represented by Union, of either setting his speed to minus 1 or plus 1. Next, I have the angel turn. We know this is angel because there's a D at the end, representing duality or switching players. Note that this D or duality is the only thing that separates this hybrid game from a hybrid system. Angel gets to set the speed to whatever she wants, but she must prove that that speed is within the range plus or minus one, representing her physical abilities. If it's within range, this will be an easy proof. If it's not within range, this proof will be impossible. Now we switch back to the demon player. Demon controls the differential equation representing our physics. We say that the position x continuously changes according to the sum of the speeds of the players. But Demon can only evolve this equation so long as he proves the domain constraint, which is separated by an ampersand. At all points, we must remain within the range of xl to xr. And Demon must prove that this holds at every time. Note that Demon controls the duration of this differential equation. In that sense, it is more similar to a timed game rather than a differential game where players might compete continuously. Differential games are also useful, but they are not the focus of this paper. Lastly, Demon gets to repeat the game and play for as many rounds as he likes. He must eventually stop the game, but he can interactively decide, am I done or would I like to play for one more round? Now let's look at a system that represents a winning strategy for this game. The winning strategy is a mirroring strategy similar to strategies you may have seen for Nim and other classic games. If Demon plays minus one, I respond with one. If Demon plays one, I respond with minus one. Surprisingly, our strategy can also simplify this differential equation to a discrete program. Don't worry about this now because I'll talk about it later. But the idea is that instead of a differential equation, we can let Demon set x to whatever he wants as long as he can prove that the invariants of the differential equation were satisfied. Note that these invariants, as well as our assignments one and minus one, are not written in the game. These are things that would come from a proof. And while these structurally look different from the game, we can actually prove with our refinement calculus that there is a refinement relationship between the game and the system implementing its strategy. I'd also like to note that Angel has very limited control. The only thing Angel is controlling is the speed VA. Keep that in mind as we discuss proofs in the rest of the talk. That's it for the example. Let's talk a bit about the semantics. For the sake of time, I'm going to give you a few cases of angel and a few cases of demon. Each of these cases are dual to one another. Because we wanted to be constructive, and because game logics are very expressive, we settled on type theory as our foundations. 
we interpret a formula P as a predicate over states. If Angel is playing a test, then Angel has to prove that both the test condition Q and the post condition P hold in the current state S. We prove this with a pair. If Demon is playing, then Angel just waits for Demon to prove the property Q, from which Angel gets to prove P. Non-deterministic assignments, which are controlled by the players, work just like quantifiers, or they work just like sigma and pi types. If Angel is in control, then Angel has to give an actual witness V telling us the new value of X. Then Angel proves P in the updated state. Whereas if Demon is playing, we wait for Demon to tell us the value V so that we can prove P regardless of the value. The cases for discrete choices are similar. If Angel is playing, we prove a coproduct. Either we say that we're playing alpha and give the alpha strategy, or we say that we're playing beta and we give the beta strategy. If Demon is playing, then Angel must be prepared to play alpha or be prepared to play beta. We don't get to pick, so we have to prove a pair. These cases also highlight what it means to be constructive and the kinds of case analysis principles that we have in a constructive proof. To be constructive, Angel has to explicitly witness sigmas and coproducts, but in a demotic proof, we only have a constructive function over values v. This is a constructive real, so we have limited power to inspect it. In contrast, Demon will have to tell us which branch of alpha choose beta he takes, meaning that we do get to know which branch our opponent is playing. We know whether Demon chose speed plus one or speed minus one. Next, we have the duality case, which simply says that diamonds turn into boxes and vice versa. If Angel was currently playing, Angel plays the dual game by handing control over to Demon. The above cases are review from tomorrow's paper. What's new in this paper is our definition of refinement. We needed a new definition because most definitions are restricted to systems or are restricted to classical settings. Please note that this is a demonic or box refinement. It is dual to the angelic refinements, which you might be more familiar with. If it helps, you could read this with the less than or equal to sign reversed. To define refinement, we simply read off the elimination rule that we would like to have. We say that if you give me a post condition P, and you give me a proof of box alpha P in some state S, I can compute or construct a proof of box beta P in the same state S. Note that the state is the same while P changes. States are local, but post conditions are global. This has a nice higher order nature of mapping strategies into other strategies. I did leave out one detail. Feel free to skip this if you're not familiar with the type theory, but I did want to cover this in the talk. I just quantified over something of kind state to type, which would have been an impredicative quantification. That's bad. We need a predicative formalization. In fact, we use type theoretic features that cannot be combined with impredicative quantifiers. To fix this, we use an infinite tower of predicative universes. You can quantify over universe i, but the refinement will then belong to universe i plus 1. If you're just interested in the practical use of this calculus, rest assured that you can hide this behind the scenes. How does this relate to its elimination rule? The elimination rule for boxes says that if you prove alpha p and you have a refinement from alpha to beta, then you can get beta p. And there's a syntactically checkable side condition that shows things are in the right universe. If you're more familiar with angelic refinements, we do have an angelic refinement rule as well. But the rest of this talk only needs box refinements, so that's what we discussed today. Speaking of proof rules, what are the refinement rules in our system? We built our logic by combining several existing systems. They all have some of the features we want, but none of them have all the features that we want. For example, some rules do not work in context, some rules only work for systems, and some rules only work classically. In many cases, we had to generalize these existing rules, but even when the text of the rules is the same, we have totally new soundness proofs because we have a totally new foundation. The first set of rules are those from game algebra. A lot of these are nice simple algebraic properties, like transitivity, reflexivity, associativity, commutativity. Some of these, like distributivity, are actually often used in practical proofs. This might be one way to split a proof into cases. However, all of these rules are of mathematical interest because they show foundational algebraic properties. And they also serve as a great sanity check, and they also help us understand which equalities hold for systems versus games. For the sake of time, I'm only showing you a few of the rules. The second class of rules are those which help us resolve a strategic choice. Here, the dualities mean that Angel is in control. 
So if Angel gets to control a choice between alpha and beta, she's allowed to just play alpha, or she's allowed to just play beta. And if you combine this with some case analysis rule, we could say that some of the times you play alpha and some of the times you play beta. If Angel is in control of a non-deterministic assignment, that means she can set it to whatever value she likes. That also means that if she wants to set it based on a term f, she can. Here, assigning x to f is dual to itself because it is deterministic. A deterministic assignment refines an angelic assignment. We also have rules that let us compose simple games into big ones. If I have two alphas and two betas, I might want to first refine the alphas and then refine the betas in order to refine the compositions. This rule has been used before and it is even sound for games. But it's extremely limiting. It doesn't work in context. In order to support context, we needed another rule. When proving a composition in context, alpha 1 actually needs to be a system, indicated in bold. This is because game logics lack some basic dynamic logic axioms, such as Kripke's axiom k. Anything else would be unsound. We then refine beta 1 and beta 2, but we must update the context in beta 1 and beta 2 after executing alpha 1. By combining these two rules, we can prove properties that could not be proven with one rule by itself. How do we refine differential equations? Feel free to skim these rules, but they are insightful. If Angel is controlling a differential equation, and there is a simple solution for that equation, then we can actually turn this angelic continuous game into a discrete deterministic system. We could set the time to our chosen duration d, we could set x to our solution, and just set the derivatives to follow the equation. It's somewhat surprising that we can relate angelic systems to deterministic systems, and that we can relate continuous systems to discrete. However, unlike our example, most systems will have complicated equations that do not have elementary closed forms. For this, we use invariant reasoning. CDGL already has a rule which checks an invariant, so we talk about the refinement rules that would be used with an invariant. A differential cut, DC, says that if you prove an invariant q, then you can freely add and remove q to and from the domain constraint. Differential weakening, dw, says that you could actually forget a differential equation and just remember the domain. Here, Angel is handing over power to Demon. Demon is allowed to set x to whatever he likes, so long as he proves the domain constraint and proves any invariance that we added along the way, for example, using dc. These are the rules that we used in our example. Now that we can prove refinements, how do we extract a system from a game proof? How do we reify a strategy? We write a proof tree and a system with a squiggly arrow to indicate that a proof of a diamond or box property of a game reifies into some system. Here, alpha and beta indicate recursive calls. If post condition P includes some more games, we would want to synthesize those games as well. On the top left, we have a deterministic assignment. This is easy to synthesize. We already wrote the assignment in the game, and so we write it in the output as well. Note the subtle relationship between this rule and the angelic non-deterministic assignment on the right. Here the game does not tell us what the assignment should be, but the proof does. Because this was a constructive proof of an assignment, it contains a witness f, which we can output. This rule really highlights the computational content of a game proof. This content was not present in the game model. The reification rules for DW and DC look much like the refinement rules. If your proof uses DW, you would extract a guarded assignment. You allow Demon to set X to whatever he likes so long as the invariance, domain constraint, and differential equation are satisfied. Differential cut simply says we prove an invariant R and then add that to the domain constraint, usually before calling DW. Not only is it cute that we can over-approximate a differential equation with a guarded assignment, this can have practical ramifications as well. If we wish to monitor a system, it is much easier to monitor an invariant than to monitor the exact trajectory of a differential equation. Let's return briefly to our example. Earlier I described a basic strategy for winning a one-dimensional push-pull card game. Let's write calligraphy A for the standard proof. Not only can the refinement rules be used to show that there is a refinement relationship between the game and between the winning strategy system, but if we reify the standard proof that Angel wins this game, we would actually get this system as the output. In each case, Angel sets VA to 1 or minus 1 based on Demon's choice. 
While we could have kept the differential equation intact, we can also refine it into a guarded assignment. This says that we let Demon pick x however he likes, so long as x prime agrees with x, and so long as the invariants are proven. In the simplest case, the guarded assignment would also test that x was in the range xl xr because that's part of the domain constraint. However, refinement logics also allow us to weaken a test. Because x equals x0 is sufficient to ensure safety, we are allowed to omit the domain constraint from this proof. This is somewhat similar to how we omitted the test that VA is in between plus and minus 1. Because Angel has proven this test to pass, we do not need to leave it in the system. The tests in the system are tests for demon. We showed how to reify our example, but what do we know about reification? In our paper, we proved three properties. The first one is simple. When you reify a strategy, you get back something that actually is a system. It does not contain dualities. The second theorem says that the safety property you proved for your game applies to the system. Remember that calligraphy A was supposed to be a winning strategy that proves P. So if we follow strategy A, we should expect P to hold. We also have a refinement property. This is somewhat subtle, but the refinement holds in the converse direction. So any safety property of the reified system is also a safety property of the game. The way to understand this is that reifying a strategy takes power away from Angel and gives more power to Demon. So if a property holds even for a more powerful Demon in Alpha Bold, then that property also holds for the weaker Demon in Alpha. There are some minor side conditions governing when these theorems can be used. Feel free to ask about them during the Q&A. Reification transfer would be very important for our proposed applications of synthesis. Existing tools want to know that the input system is proven safe. This theorem shows that if we prove a game and then extract a system from the game, we also have a safety proof for the system as these tools would require. Refinement is important for several reasons. One, it complements the reification transfer theorem very nicely. The first theorem shows that demon is not too strong. The second theorem shows that demon is not too weak. By knowing that demon is neither too strong nor too weak, we're confident that we have settled on a great correctness specification for this reify operator. Refinement may also be useful for practical verification. Imagine that you have a proof tool, whether automatic or interactive, that only supports systems. Refinement says that you could write down a game, write a strategy for that game, and just do a proof about the system for that strategy, from which the proof would follow for the game. In conclusion, let's review all the main components of this talk. We developed a refinement logic. This lets you say whether the behaviors of alpha are more than the behaviors of beta. You can also say if they are equal. Refinement is useful for practical verification where you want to prove a simple system and conclude something about a complicated system. We did this in the setting of a constructive differential game logic, which is the subject of tomorrow's talk at Ichkar. While hybrid games are imperative, CDGL gives us a constructive interpretation of diamond and box modalities, and it gives us a constructive Curry-Howard isomorphism. Proofs about games correspond to computable strategies. I would encourage the community to join me in exploring these Curry-Howard isomorphisms for logics that are about stateful programs. That is for logics, dynamic logics, and game logics. We gave a new definition of refinement. This is surprisingly subtle for constructive games rather than classical systems. We studied hybrid dynamics, which opened up a lot of applications for cyber-physical systems. It also allowed us to highlight the relationships between discrete and continuous systems. If you'd like to hear more about the foundations of this, which are based in constructive analysis, please check out the paper or tomorrow's talk. By studying games, we got to highlight the nice relationship between angels and diamonds, as well as the nice relationship between boxes and demons. Games also allow us to write better models of cyber-physical systems. Other cars on the road might be an adversary, or the road itself might have potholes that are placed in adversarial locations. Game logics are more expressive than dynamic logics, which gave us unique technical challenges as well. By combining these features, we formalized and proved a folklore theorem showing that once you've proven a strategy for a game, you can extract a system which implements that strategy. We show that it follows the same safety post condition as the game it started with, and we show that it also refines the game. Moving forward, this shows that reducing games to systems is a viable approach to implement tools which target hybrid games. This is important because today there are much better tools available for hybrid systems than there are for hybrid games. 
It's possible that this refinement could help us develop new proof tools as well as synthesis tools. Not only that, but some refinement properties might be interesting theorems in and of themselves. We might be able to prove whether one control strategy dominates the behavior of another. Because winning strategies of games correspond to systems, we could also use refinements to compare those systems. In doing so, we could answer the question of whether two strategies are fundamentally the same, or whether two strategies are somehow different. I would encourage you to read the papers and to talk to me if you are interested in any of these aspects. Whether it is constructive logics of programs, whether it is constructive refinement, or whether it is practical tooling for cyber-physical systems. Thank you. I will now take questions. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Brandon, for your talk. So now it's time of questions. So uh, I recall that you can uh, address questions either by clicking uh, at the question and answer block uh, at the bottom of your application or by raising your hand. And so you can set the questions directly. So I have, uh, I have one question, uh, Brandon, is uh, about the fact that we are using uh, your, your one of your applications uh, is uh, physical systems, and in 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 that framework, uh, one can uh, uh, wish to use uh, probabilistic data. So, what happens if you add this kind of uh, uh, feature to your system? Have you already uh, think about that? Yes. So this logic is definitely possibilistic. It's not probabilistic. Um, there are some other works within our lab that look at stochastic systems. We don't have anything for stochastic plus hybrid plus games because that's just a lot to do all at once. Um, I think it would be very interesting to study a computational interpretation for the probabilistic logics, but you know that's, uh, that's very much future work. Okay, thank you. And... So please uh, either uh, address questions by the question and answer block box. You can text them uh, their questions or by raising the, uh, the hands. And I have another question since uh, for the moment uh, there are no other questions uh, uh, waiting. Is uh, about uh, uh, the possible the, the way you represent if you if you if you work with the continuous system with the real numbers you have problems of uh, rounding errors or things like that uh, maybe your logic would like to handle this kind of uh, of, of 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 issues uh, have you talked about that or is yes so that's in the paper and it's in tomorrow's talk i can give you the short version now um, so we don't use floating point numbers. We use Bishop style constructive real arithmetic, which is exact. And what comes out of that is that you don't have excluded middle. You have a sort of um, epsilon based comparison rule, which means that sometimes your strategies have to change a little bit and your control has to change a little bit to make sure that it is sound and fully correct, even when you use this inexact comparison. Perfect. Thank you. Any other question? We have uh, some minutes more, so maybe there is someone who is thinking about other questions. So if not, uh, thanks to the speaker again. Thank you very much, Brendan.